Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, What's New in PTC Creo 6.0. My name is Alex Janicki, Director of Marketing here for TriStar, and I'll be your moderator. I did want to introduce Paul Dye, Pre-Sales Specialist for PTC's Virtual Center of Excellence. In just a moment, I'm going to be handing the mic over to Paul. But I did want to mention that this presentation is being recorded and will be available on demand shortly after the live session. Um, I have also included a handout that you can kind of take away with you or look at during the presentation. It's just got sort of some quick top features of Creo 6.0. Um, finally, if you do have any questions, feel free to leave them in the chat and we'll be more than happy to address them after the live session. Uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and pass the microphone over to Paul. Please enjoy. Hey, thank you, Alex. So again, thank you for the introduction. My name is Paul Dye. I'm an application engineer with PTC. And today I'm here to basically answer the question, what's new in Creo 6? So today we're gonna go over a lot of different information because we've really made a lot of different changes in Creo 6.0. So if at any point we have the recording, you can go back and reference anything we talked about. But without further ado, we will dive in. So one of the biggest challenges that a lot of our customers are facing today is the blending and emerging in the digital world, which we're used to working in, in the physical world, where our designs and processes are actually occurring. There's a huge benefit to being able to transfer data between these two different worlds, and a lot of smart companies are starting to do this. Things like augmented reality, new simulation techniques, new ways of manufacturing, such as 3D printing, and finally, of course, our CAD software has to be able to keep up with all these ever-changing processes and techniques. And that's what we're here to discuss today. How Creo 6 can act as the scene between these two different facets of the industry, and really start to unlock all the potential that we have in both the physical and the digital world. And starting off with a personal favorite of mine, we have augmented reality. This is something that we've been refining over the past couple of years. And with Creo 6.0, we've made it even easier to work with. This begins with the ability to view your models. So now for each user, we can have up to 10 models that can be published and stored. So we're able to pull our models up and view them as an augmented reality experience on whatever compatible device that we happen to be using. We're also now able to generate QR codes for launching these experiences. This includes support for the HoloLens, our 3D eyewear. So if you have this hardware, this is really a new exciting way to view these models and things like design reviews or things of that nature. With all these models and experiences, we need a way to keep all of this under control. And with our system, you can set each model to be public or password protected. You can also add multiple emails to share this thing out and overall work and collaborate in a clean and safe environment. Probably one of the biggest moves that we made with Creo 6.0 is towards simulation driven design. So let's first discuss a bit of background on the challenges that this addresses. In the traditional way, if you want to do simulation in the design process, you generally either have to consult an expert or you yourself would have to be very knowledgeable in analysis. Also, we wouldn't be working with the actual model. We'd probably be working with a simplified, defeatured version of that. As you might know, this process is very iterative. So every time that you run a simulation, you need to go back into your design, make changes, then start the simulation over again. And this whole process just takes a very long time. Well, with Creo 6.0, we're introducing a brand new approach to this process. One that doesn't see simulation as this separate step in the process. So every engineer throughout each step of the design process can start to make use of these capabilities of simulation. And it's gonna be fast, easy, and this is possible through the use of products such as Creo Simulation Live. What we've done is partner with ANSYS and use their discovery engine directly in Creo to do simulation right on top of the model. So we're getting instantaneous analysis and getting those results as soon as we make a change in the model. And this is directed at every engineer, not just the expert analysis. And now we can start to work further towards that simulation driven design. Once again, first and foremost, this is fast. So right now simulation is seen as something that's done way later in the overall design process. And what we want to do here is take all the simulation capabilities and put them right on top of the model that you're working on. That begins by defining our constraints, loads, and building out that analysis. And one of the biggest differences here is opposed to traditional simulation processes, you don't have to go through and defeature that model, get rid of all those rounds and holes. 
go ahead, leave them all in, and then you just simply run the simulation. And we can see that we're getting back analysis results almost as soon as we click that button. We can see them right on the model. And that's the difference here. We aren't sending off to an expert and waiting hours or days to get results back. The results are right here, right now. And with that, you can continue to drive your design, making whatever changes using that feedback. Now, I know that maybe we're getting stress on this face here. So let's add in maybe a trajectory rib there and see maybe how those stress values are gonna be affected. And now that I made that change, I can check the numbers and really be confident in the decisions that I've made. Moving forward with this software is really quite a game changer in the world of design. The ability to apply loads and conditions right on the model while you're designing it, not something that you're sending off for simply a pass or fail test. You may still use something like Creo Simulate, you get a very exact answer once everything's said and done, but the simulation live makes it so by the time you get to that point, you already know that your design is the best design. And it's all very exciting. And initially it's gonna be built out for structural, modal and thermal modes of analysis. But moving on into the future, we're gonna be adding to that and working and building upon those capabilities. With Creo 6.0.1, we've built upon our ability to use mechanism loads. So if you have a mechanism, you can have it generate the load and transfer that into Creo Simulation Live. You can also take boundary conditions at the part level and promote them up to the top assembly, and we'll be able to define simulation bodies. Moving on, we've done a lot when it comes to usability and productivity and simply general enhancements to base Creo. As we've been doing the past releases of Creo, we've continued to build out the functionality first of the mini toolbar. So now this is available in things like creation and modification. And the way that it's been built out is very intelligent. It works in context with whatever you happen to be doing, and it lessens the need to have to click around everywhere and search out for what you need. It's all built out into the actions that you, the user, are taking. We can see that anytime I click to make a move, I'm getting quick and direct options to what I need to use. Now let's discuss some changes that we have with the model tree and specifically how we navigate it. We can have active components that are clearly differentiated from the other components. Everything else has been grayed out for us. And we can also see it's the same with the insert mode. So we have these bars showing exactly where we're working and we have common filters on by default. So Creo knows what settings that we like, and it will essentially auto save the settings between sessions. Still have the same functionality all as you had before, just able to remember all of that now. Here we have changes to the graphing capabilities. So for example, if we have something like a curvature analysis or simply any feature that creates a graph, we've improved the options and the controls that go right along with it. This includes better ways of setting up the graph, creating gradients, changing those colors, and really anything that you really need to do in a much more modern and easy to use interface. When it comes to the user interface design, everything has really been updated and has a great new look to it here. So in the whole time, for example, things like type, profile settings, everything looks very clean and it is very easy to use. We also have a feature here that is access to help. So with different features, we can see a quick summary of what that feature does. And we can get maybe read more info into it, which is great for new users or even a feature that maybe an experienced user just hasn't used in a while. You can get that quick information now. Here we have updates to sheet metal, mostly having to do with increased productivity. It's much more intuitive for things like creating walls, and this includes a lot of instant options. Works well with creating those corners, building out different seams and reliefs. And of course, as we're building everything out, we see instant previews right on the model. We also have a new dashboard for things like creating and merging walls. And again, working in that beautiful new interface that we can see up on the screen now. The volume sweep also has some new uses. And this is something that we were very excited to release over in Creo 5.0. And we've kept building upon it as we've gone forward. This is where we're taking something like a solid model and we're taking it through a helical sweep to create things like cutting and grinding tools. 
And what we've added is the ability to keep that helical tool path. So we've always displayed it when we were using the tool, but now moving forward, we're able to actually keep that path. And this is available for normal helical sleeps as well. Point projection is an ability that is also new to 6.0. And we, so we can take something like a vertex, a datum point, endpoint, and then project it onto something like a planar surface, a datum plane, or simply a straight line. And this could potentially be very useful for defining things like references and maybe how they line up exactly with your part. Drill tip angle. So in the whole options, we generally have a preset value for the tip angle at I believe 118 degrees, but some customers don't use this default. So what we've done is give the user the option to define this default value to wherever they happen to need. More improvements to model-based design here, or MBD, primarily focused around the ability to take notes. So much like we did with the ability to do dimensioning and tolerances, we've built out a specific dashboard for notes. We have different options for formatting and fonts, symbols, basically bringing out note-taking abilities and modernizing it like we've done with other annotations. We have semantic definition support for whatever things that we happen to type in, and increase flexibility with our annotation features. So take one set, maybe move it over to another feature, just continuing to improve upon the overall usability as much as possible. Here we have now the ability to get automatic notifications for any new maintenance releases. So with yearly releases of Creo now coming out, we constantly are looking to improve upon and build all the time. It can really be hard to keep up with all these different changes. So now we have an option to keep our users up to date. And of course, there are maybe some users that don't wanna be consistently reminded. So we do give the option, of course, to disable this if needed. When it comes to rendering, Render Studio now has support for emissive appearances. So what that means is if we have an object that's emitting light and it interacts, and we can see that how it interacts with itself and its surroundings. So now we can take a component or a surface and build us some very cool and very realistic renders with that emissive lighting. Same thing here with animations. So if you have the Render Studio license, you have the option to take your animations and render them over in Render Studio. So it makes those animations look very clean, very professional, and all you need to do is have the Render Studio license and you're good to go. Of detailing. So this is something that has been highly, highly requested and we did listen. And what we have now is the option to take the model name and whenever we're going and starting a drawing, have it be the same as the model. It just keeps everything organized and cuts out any type of confusion with file names. We do have the option, if you don't want to do this, it's a checkbox. So just keep it unchecked and go about as you always have. A nice thing here is the option to alter your dimension, backgrounds, and style. In Creo, we've picked some settings normally that would work for the majority of people. But if you want to change this for whatever reason, maybe your part colors or just a personal preference, go ahead and do that. The last section that I want to go over has to do with our design of manufacturing. And we're putting a lot of focus into this here. So this is what we're going to discuss on next. The first section I want to discuss is latticing, specifically new types of lattice features. So the first of this is called stochastic. So think of a foam type a support where we have a more randomized structure. So it's not as much of a rigid structure and we can start to decide exactly how dense that I want to make these beams together. So we can see that up on the screen, that more randomized selection. This can be very conformal. So we can see right on the model here, we can change around the lattice and it really builds out to the volume or the surface that I have defined for it. And as we keep going, we can build up the density and see what that would look like. Same thing here with formula driven lattices. So we have three new main types and that includes gyroid, primitive and diamond. The only reason that we're really able to utilize these now is because of all the advancements that we have in 3D printing in that world. And one of the biggest things that this has to do with is self-supporting geometries. This means that all of these lattices, because of the way that they've been built out, can actually be designed to work with no support structures. 
So this makes our punch time much less, and there's no time wasted trying to remove all that support material. And each of these lattices, of course, have a lot of different options that we're able to play with and really build out the perfect lattice for whatever your part or whatever your need happens to be. So this is crazy when I first saw the developers were building this out. And this is the ability to create your own custom lattice cells. So what that means is we're able to take a Creo part that you or I have built out and build the lattice right from that. So we simply select custom as the lattice type and then go in and grab that Creo model that you wanna use. And you can see here right on the model, whenever we bring that part in, it's gonna automatically build out the lattice using the cell that we defined. And we can see this very quick and we can try out different shapes and sizes. Really, your imagination is the limit with this tool. I mean, I can't guarantee that the lattice that maybe you've designed is gonna be the best possible design, but you can try anything out and finally start to see exactly what works. Here with lattice transitions, this is specifically between beam-based lattices and the walls of your part. So build up the areas that you wanna support without the use of support structures. This means less material being used overall and faster times to get those prints through the printer. On the design side, we're actually able to build out our designs from additive manufacturing. So rather than rate waiting on maybe until after you've designed the part to check whether it's gonna print well or not, do that right as you're building the part and use this feature early and often. Here, what we can do is set our critical angle, set maybe our subcritical angle, figure out what's optimal here, and then color code my model to show what might work along with might, what might need some work as well. When I mentioned critical angle, that essentially means anything greater than the angle that's gonna require supports. So what I can do is run a down skin analysis, and this takes critical and subcritical angles that you define, takes it into account, and then the system does an optimization to best reduce that critical angle in the model and see what orientation gives the least amount of support. And most times we're gonna end up getting an angle that maybe we wouldn't have thought of, maybe on a weird angle, whereas I would have normally just laid that flat on the tray. Now we're seeing, oh, I may not have thought of that initially, but we're saving further on that support material along with time. We've extended our support out for this new 3MF file type. So with that, things like materials and colors are actually included in the print file, that 3MF file way more than just what you would have with that tessellated STL file. And also in Windows 10, we actually get a very cool preview of some of these files whenever we're going through our file explorer, so we can see that right in there. We can also do our slicing right within Korea with this extension. We can generate that CLI, CLI file, and then we can visualize the slicing right within our build tray, all within Korea. I can support or export this type of format as opposed to simply exporting the STL or 3MF file type. We have four options with that. When we move over into the world of topology optimization, we can optimize components in context with the assembly. So before we can only do this as a single part by itself. Now we can run that in context with adjacent geometry and see how that would look not only improving how we're running the optimization, but also how we're able to view the results of that study. So we have improved the animation of those results, we have greater control and more tools to edit the resulting geometry. And after I have those results, how do I want to parametrically build out this part? Now I'm able to specify exactly how I want to rege regenerate this geometry, whereas before I could only have a freestyle surface, now I can use things like facets to move the spacing of nodes around, which allows me to define exactly the level of detail that I want with my part. So that's really it for the major improvements that I wanted to highlight on. A lot of minor improvements that I don't necessarily have time to all go over. But what I wanna look at here is a high level overview of the roadmap going forward regarding some of the future releases of Creo. So we've moved on to yearly releases of Creo where we have a major release coming out every third year. So that starts with Creo 4.0, the next major release happening with Creo 7.0. In between that, for all the users that wanna stay up to date with everything that we're working on and improving in Creo, because everything's moving along very quickly nowadays, we have yearly releases such as Creo 5.0 and 6.0.
It's going to follow that general pattern going forward. So now what I'd like to do is move over into a demonstration to showcase some of the functionality that we just discussed. And this is going to be primarily focused around the additive manufacturing capabilities that we went over a little bit towards the end. Okay. So for this demonstration, we're going to be working with our Polaris snowmobile. And particularly with that, we are going to be working with the swing arm assembly. Now let's open that up and take a gander into this. Using traditional manufacturing techniques, this would probably require each of these parts to be machined separately, then maybe welded together to, assemb to assemble this. So even a simple part such as this might actually be pretty complex when it comes to actually fabricating it in the real world. With all the improvements going on in the world of additive manufacturing, we're going to choose to 3D print this component. And that's going to help us to cut down the cost of actually getting this piece into action. Now, what we'll do is close out of that whole assembly and then open up just the one part that we want to start working with and optimizing on. Once this is open, we can see that we've already started building out the optimization for this part. And you can see that there's a basic lattice structure built out, and that's going to be the base for my design. So if you haven't seen anything with the additive manufacturing tool in Creo, this is as easy as determining the area where the lattice is going to be located and then start to define the outer bound to the lattice. And once we have that done, the system's going to go through and automatically generate that lattice depending on any of the options that I've laid out for it. We also have the ability to shell out the entire part where to put that lattice or just simply replace a solid region with the lattice structure. Here's where we can use that we, we can start to utilize the formula driven lattices that I mentioned during the presentation. So those are again driven by a mathematical formula that determines how each cell is going to be self supporting and how to best fit into the area that you, the user, has defined. We have the options to change things like wall thickness and size of the lattice, and we can see right on the model what that's going to look like. And these lattice types give us the ability to use some very strong geometry. It would have been very difficult to build out by ourselves, but are going to be very easy with this lattice tool. Now we can build out designs using this lattice. That I can be sure that they're not only strong, but aren't going to require a ton of different support material to actually build out. On top of these new lattice types, we've also made improvements to the generation and propagation of each lattice. So in the past, when you would build out a larger complex lattice structure, it might take more than a few seconds to actually generate that entire structure. In Creo 6.0, we made some general improvements and made this process much faster and the propagation of that is much easier. Again, on top of formula types, we also have stochastic lattices, like I mentioned, more of a foam structure of interconnected beams, along with custom and user-defined lattice types. So now that I've built out that lattice for my model, I want to be able to share this design off with other people on my team. So this is something that we began building out with Creo 4.0, the idea of incorporating augmented reality into our design. So this box that we're putting in is a spatial target. This essentially acts as the surface that my model is going to sit on and the orientation of how I'll be able to view it. Just a few options regarding the quality that I want to publish this out as. And just like that, I'm able to share this design out with whoever I need to. This has been pushed up into the cloud and I can share this off with whoever I need to even password protected to make sure that only the right people are seeing my models. And Creo actually streamlined the process of sharing our parts off. So rather than having to send it off as individual emails and simply export to maybe 15 or 20 people and do that right from Creo. So now that I've shared this design off, I might wanna start to making sure and verifying that my design works as intended. We can do that with Creo Simulate which is PTC's analysis solution, that allows users to analyze and validate the performance of their 3D models or prototypes. For the sake of time, I've already gone through and set up an analysis. We can look through some of the loads that I have, constraints and fixed surfaces, simulating something that's happening in the real world. With all this laid out, we can start to dive into some of the results of the study, and begin to understand this part a bit better. What we've been building in Creo is an environment, where you don't have to jump between different programs to understand some of these different things about our model. We're able to build out the part, do some optimization with the lattice features, and then see the simulation results all right here. So we can just load this up and then start to see these results right on the model. 
So because of how I define the forces, I can see that maybe I have an issue at that point. I have a high amount of stress focused on a single location, but now I know where that failure is gonna be likely to occur. And using Creo Simulate or Creo Simulation Live, like I mentioned, we're able to find this issue early in the process and go through and fix this before it ever gets printed in the first place. This is a lot better than much later finding that out and having to go back and redesign everything. All these tools that we're building out in Creo that we just keep updating and improving on with each new release is simply putting more and more capabilities into the hands of our users. This is really helping to drive our designs to be as great as they possibly can be. So here we can see the results of maybe making some changes. And finally, I'm happy with some of the analysis that we're getting and I can move on and get ready to actually 3D print this part. So one of the new features that I wanna show off here is the ability to define some build directions. So we're gonna exit out of the simulation and move over into that. So this takes our model and using our inputs gives us the best possible orientation to 3D print from. This is something that in the past, I would have had to take the model into another program to tell me, hey, how should I actually place this into my 3D printer? Well, now I can just do this right in Creo. Let's go through, punch in some of those values, things like critical and subcritical angles. And here we'll move through and type those in. I know maybe I want 30 degrees for my critical angle, and then I'll define a downskin analysis. So instead of me myself going through and trying to figure out the optimum angles to place the model in the tray, if I have the additive manufacturing plus extension, the system's gonna go through and automatically update to figure this out. So this is not me going through all these iterations, it's already done for me. I can simply run through the study, close out of it, and then the system is gonna put the part into that orientation. And it's likely not something that we would have thought of by ourselves. So we can look at that and say, yeah, that's probably not how I would have laid that in there. I probably would have thought of another idea. And on top of that, we can view this build direction as maybe an orientation in our CAD environment before we go through and save it off. So here we can see that display. We have that build direction right there and we're good to go. Now, like I mentioned with Creo 6.0, we're able to go out and save this off as a 3MF file format. That again is a format that can communicate a lot of different 3D printing software and give a higher fidelity model with additional information such as color and material. Here, I'll save this off as a copy and head over to my 3D printing foil folder and go ahead and find that 3MF file format. And we could still save that off as an STL. That's no problem if we wanted to do that. We have options when we come into this now. So here we have our actual trace setup. This is something that we introduced back in Creo 3.0 actually, and that's the ability to visualize the model in the tray. And over time, we've been building up this feature to exactly fit your tray and how the part is scaled and oriented. And since I already did that build direction analysis, I can simply use that here in my tray. Now going through and doing things such as editing the actual support structure for my model. So because I set up my critical angle to be 30 in the build direction study, go through and define that here as well. Also have the option to save that profile or just simply use the default setup every time. So now, one thing to note when we generate the support structure, we're actually generating a part file for that support. So if I wanted to go in and do any modifications to that structure, we could open it up and work with it. So here we're begin actually previewing this file before the 3D printing and by running it through our slicer in Creo. So this improves the printability of the part that we're working with and puts it into a format that the 3D printer really understands. So no longer letting two different softwares interpret the geometry two different ways, just simply create the CLI file right in Creo and put that into many different types of printers. So here we're looking through all the different layers and building up the part that we're creating. So we can scan through make sure that there aren't going to be any problems when we actually go to run the sprint. Now, I could analyze all 1,144 layers of this if I wanted to. I won't individually go through all of that for the sake of time, but now I'm happy with that and I'm able to save that tray off if maybe I want to use this later on in reference back to some of the settings that I used. We could also just save that off as a 3MF file type or simply just as an STL as we've always been able to do. Like I mentioned earlier, within Windows 10, we're able to get this cool visualization of 3MF file types right in the File Explorer. So anytime that I wanna get a quick preview of what's going on with any of these files, 
just highlight over it and see it without having to go through and open it up individually. Okay, well, that's basically what I wanna go over with what's new in Creo 6.0. So now that's the end of my presentation and we'll be happy to take in any questions at this point. That was great, Paul. I'm just gonna hold a few moments for any questions to come in. Um, I did wanna mention again, an on-demand recording will be sent shortly after this. And we do want to hear from you as far as uh, any feedback we have on our webinars, what you may like to see in the future. So a brief survey is going to be sent to everyone uh, along with the re recording. Uh, if you could just take a moment to fill it out, we'd really appreciate it. Um, let me see here. Just give it another moment here. All right, it looks like we got one coming in. All right, Paul, is it possible to replace 3D models and drawings now? Not just, of, uh, basically not just models from family tables. Uh, in terms of the drawings rather than the family tables? I believe so, yeah. Uh, I'm not entirely sure on that one. I believe it might be able to be possible. I could check in after the call and we could uh, get that information out there. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so the person that asked that question, uh, we, we can send you information on that. Let's just hold another moment here. And really, if uh, there's any questions after this presentation, you know, don't hesitate to visit tristar.com, give us a call. Um, we're definitely available to kind of go over anything that you may not have uh, later. Um, but it does look like that is it. Um, so with that said, unless there's anything else, um, thank you again, Paul, and thank you everyone else for attending. Okay. Thank you very much.